I'm Chris Preston. And I'm Brad Zimmerman. And welcome to Street Check, the best podcast in the history of Cabot Wealth Network. Uh, at least that's what I keep telling myself uh, and you. Um, Brad, we before we get into investing, something happened in the last week that's never happened in yours and my, or Madison, our producer's uh, lifetime. Can, can you guess what it is? Shh. Caveat, Amer- something America has never done in our lifetime, which I was surprised. Uh, private moon landing fell over? Y- yes, well, <laughs> that too. Landed <laughs> on the moon. We haven't landed on the moon since 1972. And we just did oh. it. And it that was good. It was a good news cycle for like, what, 12 hours? Six? I just, <laughs> I think it's remarkable that that was my poll. Because like you didn't, I, I was impre- you didn't give me yeah. any context. Like thing happened in our lifetime that has never happened before. So then I added America. Like America had never. I don't. I don't know what if Russia's been landing on the moon. You know, over and over. But um, uh, China sent a moon lander up in the last couple of years. I yeah. think India had a moon mission as well. But yeah. I don't know. It's absent doing something. It's it very much feels been there, done that. Like I guess if you're going to set up a base on the moon, I, I'll rah rah. Uh, you know, pro America with that, but us sending a a janky drone that falls over is not. Yeah, by we no human. Uh, right, <laughs> landed right. on the moon. Uh, it's not. You know, it's not like exactly one false, one small step for man. It's no steps for any man or woman. Um, but we were there, and this is how. This is so typical of the, um, you know, the the hyper. News cycle these days, uh, intuitive, uh, was it intuitive machines, uh, L U N R, uh, is the ticker symbols built the, um, the aircraft that landed on the moon, uh, stock went, <laughs> stock went up in the month leading up to it from like two fifty a share to eleven dollars, and in the last week down to six dollars that's how i mean i guess that's you know buy the rumor sell the news but i landing even that is not enough for people (laughs) i thought i read that they were discontinuing the operation i don't know when i initially read that it sounded like they were like closing up shop but i think they were just saying hey we're cutting off this particular moon mission Uh, who's yeah it landed on its side and like i think it ran out of power and they're waiting for I don't know how it gets power up there. But, Solar. Yeah, but like, yeah, I, I, mean, I guess, yeah, just solar. They're, they, they're waiting for the images to, for them to send the images when once the power was back on, which they've now done. Did they uh, use their own boosters and rockets or did they piggyback on some like Starlink and then have like a little lunar module? I don't know. That's, that's you know, I, I didn't do that level of research, but. Landing your first drone sideways seems like a death sentence to me. Uh, as far as like in, an investable asset, I'm like all right, yeah. you guys had a really you made it really to the moon and got images, and it, I think it's the first time on the, like the south side of the moon. I think is what it said. Um, I don't know. I, you should talk to an astrophysicist. Or yeah, we're getting way planetary. too deep in that. Let's get to <laughs> investing stuff, things that we know about. Uh, Brad, uh, what's up today? All right, uh, Bitcoin running back towards all time highs. Uh, really had a torrential kind of week. Um, Apple discontinued their EV program, the Titan. Why can't they innovate anymore? And then Beyond Meat, the week after we classified it as a what were we thinking stock, it ran up 75% after uh, announcing some cost-cutting measures. And then after we tackle our big three, we'll be welcoming on Rich Howe of spinoff stocks, I'm sorry, of stock spinoff investing.com, former Cabot analyst. Uh, he ran our Cabot, Cabot Microcap Insider Portfolio smart guy to talk about microcap stocks in general. Yeah, looking forward to talking to Rich and reconnecting with Rich, especially now microcap microcaps are um, you know, uh, sort of in line with the market but starting to make a run. But we'll get into that later. Uh first as always is our defend the take and Brad you're up this week and your take this week is that the AI narrative is beginning to show some cracks. 90 seconds. Go ahead. Okay. So there's this uh, this thing called the Gardner Hype Cycle. They're a consulting and business analytics firm. 
um, where basically they they plot out the pathway of any new technology on this hype, hype cycle. And what it starts off with is um, the innovation trigger, uh, in the case of AI, which I'm using as a broad term, uh, would have been like the publication of chat GPT a, a year and change ago. Uh, then we hit the peak of inflated expectations where everything is hype, is entirely hyped up. Then the trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, and then plateau of productivity. So new technologies, they find typically follow the same path where everything gets overhyped uh, and then disappoints everybody. But then we manage to sort of find some diamonds in the rough and, and we get actual productive technologies out of it. Similar to what we, what many people are probably familiar with us seeing in uh, terms of the internet. But on the AI front, uh, Amazon's uh, Amazon Web Services AI Labs did a study that found 57.1% of translated content on the internet is low quality AI translation that Vice News in their reporting of it called AI slime or worthless slime. Um, 30% of Amazon sellers use AI to do product descriptions in January. Uh, that was very that was very much a farce because a number of Amazon products were rolled out with descriptions that said, I cannot fulfill this request due to OpenAI's policies. Uh, those were the descriptions used on Amazon. Google just announced that they're going to be spending 60 million a year or up to 60 million a year to license content from Reddit for AI training. Um, Reddit is a message board on the internet. Uh, it's not exactly a font of experience knowledge. I mean, there are pockets certainly that are great, but that's that's going to be the foundational training data for the internet as these Fine. AI couple. Hmm. Finish your point. Uh, we are starting to see the actual results of AI uh, rather than just the hype. And while business expenditures towards AI are going to continue to be really high, um, we're starting to see the limitations of this technology in the current iteration. I'm a long time long term believer in AI as a technology, but we are getting to the peak of the hype cycle. Yeah, is this is this just like the moon the moon landing? You know, now that we're actually seeing the effects <laughs> of it, the sell off might start. I, I mean, I I think yeah, I think end of the hype cycle. I think you're right, but that doesn't mean. Yeah, I think there'll be a pullback in some AI related plays, but you know, I think there's still much money to be made in all AI, all things AI. There is one concrete point that I didn't get to that I, I would feel remiss if I did not. Um, I was looking at somebody that had sort of uh, a track record of utilizing AI in their business. Compass, which is a real estate company, COMP is the ticker, mm -hmm. uh, rolled out in 2020 a likely to sell tool, which used data analytics to anticipate the likely sellers of properties across a, a variety of geographies. Um, so it, it would sort of uh, warm people up to to talk to a realtor. It generated less than 1% of their revenues for as long as it's been in operation. Uh, it's not a very effective tool, but it is attractive to realtors somewhat. So that's, that's a, a pretty typical um, path for this for the hype cycle following technology where you get all this hype and then when the rubber meets the road it actually does uh, less than you expect and and the scope of deployment is becomes more limited although it is still valuable once you've identified the appropriate scope so i think that'll be that'll be the narrative and i i think people will see it more in their daily lives as we get deeper into the election cycle because everybody is going to use AI and AI tools and AI chatbots to try and relay political opinions. And I think people are going to just start seeing more and more spam and they're going to get a little bit fed up with it. And it's going to lose some of its luster. Um, yep. Again, does that mean sell any AI company? No, there's going to be valuable, valuable technologies that come out of this. But I do think that we're at a, a little bit of a, if not breaking point we're we're showing strain in this AI narrative to carry the weight of everybody's technology expectations all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Seems all valid, but you know, um, in, from an investing standpoint, I think, you know, we always say, oh, constantly say on here, the trends last longer than anyone, anyone expected. You know, I, 
we'll see. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it in terms of, you know, a pullback in AI related stocks. Um, maybe it'll happen next week. Maybe it'll happen next month. Maybe, you know, it won't happen till end of this year. Who knows? But um, there will be a, a deflating of the balloon uh, at, at some point, I'm sure. Um, and maybe some consolidation in the industry, but uh hype cycle, I agree with you that the narrative um, or, or we're sort of the end of the hype cycle or towards the end of the hype cycle. Um, okay, let's move on to big three. Uh, speaking of things that have been hyped before, Bitcoin, uh, it's been on a tear lately. It's up to up above 61, 62,000, 65,000 was the previous highs from 2021. Uh, looks like we're, uh, as someone on this podcast um, forecast, I can't remember who, uh, Bitcoin said that Bitcoin was headed to new all time highs. Um, what do you, uh, you know, what th the cycle with Bitcoin is that it runs to new all-time highs and then comes crashing back. And usually those crashes coincide with the market. Um, you know, I, I viewed it as a bull market sort of play. It has no other utility other than that. What, how do you view this rally? So you've got two catalysts that are, are coincident a little bit. One is the approval of Bitcoin ETFs, um, right? Anybody that's putting institutional money into these ETFs is prompting buying of Bitcoin uh, because you're putting a billion or 10 billion into uh, one of the ETFs that then has to be used to purchase Bitcoins. There's also the habiting uh, where Bitcoin reduces its mining emissions. It's programmatic. It's every 210,000 blocks. They do about 144 blocks of processing a day. So about every four years, they reduce the reward emissions for miners for validating transactions. Um, it's going from six block, uh, yeah, from six and a quarter blocks to three and an eighth blocks, probably right around April of 2024. Typically, and I, when I say typically, I mean in the three times this has happened before, price highs tend to to land about 18 months after the after that reduction in emissions um the, and then bitcoin etfs are the other thing that have yeah that you know made bitcoin. it made them easier to access made, made bitcoin more accessible and less um maybe daunting to to people yeah i mean and one of our one of our um analysts carl delfeld who runs cabot explorer just recommended to beat a bitcoin etf i won't won't name which uh to his Cabinet Explorer portfolio, like in the last couple of weeks. Where, so where it becomes problematic for me is anytime you try and apply any actual like value analytics or fundamental analytics towards it, um, Bitcoin miners net about 900 Bitcoins a day. That's 54 million. The market cap right now is 1.2 trillion. So the idea that cutting that, that, reward emission, that mining emission in half will have a material impact on the supply side is laughable at best and foolish sort of at worst. Uh, it's 19.6 million circulating supply. There is enough Bitcoin for whoever wants it at, you know, prevailing prices. It's not a good store of value. It is historically 50% more volatile than the stock market. It's not usable as a global currency. Bitcoin can support seven transactions per second. Visa can support 24,000 transactions per second. The sort of bullish narrative that you build, that that advocates build around Bitcoin loses any, any connection with reality if you actually look into the numbers. It is entirely a speculative asset. Um, there is yeah. compelling evidence that the Bitcoin, that the performance of Bitcoin as an asset class correlates better with global liquidity cycles, which is more money slushing around. So more people taking speculative bets on stuff than it, than it actually ties to anything that's technically related to Bitcoin. Um, I can't justify where it's trading. You know, I even believe in some of the tenets of Bitcoin, the idea of a decentralized global currency that's free of central bank control, the ability uh, of maybe disempowered people to use a uh, somewhat anonymous global currency to store or transfer money, you know, or dealing with hyperinflation, right? If you're in Venezuela and your currency is losing 10% in value a day, all right, it, you're better off being in Bitcoin, but it doesn't hold up 
fundamentally yep. as something that can or should retain value. It is entirely premised on the agreement that all that everybody that's buying Bitcoin has that it should be worth something. Even gold is subject to industrial utilization, right? There's a there's a demand or there's a supply cons there's a consumption element to something like gold as an asset class. There's no consumption element to Bitcoin. It doesn't get destroyed. It gets moved around and that's it. Um that said, it's probably heading for 150,000. Right. Yeah, that's so that I was going to give a history on the on the Bitcoin price. So Start of 2017, $900. Uh, by the end of that year, 19000 It fell back to, uh, in 2018, cratered, down year for the market, cratered all the way back to th just over 3000 Then it bounced back in 2019, uh, which, you know, better year for the market. By August, it was back up to 11000 Um pandemic um hitting in march 2020 took it down to 5000 by the end of 2020 sorry no a year later uh april 2021 60000 and you know had a little mini crash and then by november 2021 65000 then it came all the way back with the market in 2022 and first part of 2023 although the bottom was late 2022, all the way from 65,000 to 16,000. Now we're back up to the six. So the highs are are much higher than they were before. And the crash, you know, it doesn't come back to previous levels, but the crash is usually very pronounced. So I think we are, I think we're going to go not only past 60,000, we're going to shatter 65,000. We're going to shatter that. And I, yeah, you might be 150,000. You may have been half joking, but it's possible. Um, and then a crash will come. It's just a matter of when and when the when will coincide with the market when the market I, pulls back. I, I will only say that I wouldn't be surprised if maybe the, the blow off top was a little bit lower than others, uh, because there are people that are trying to fundamentally justify the value of it. And they are using events like the having, I think I said happening, but I meant having um, yeah. the Bitcoin having uh, event. Dropping emissions from six bitcoins per block to three and an eighth um, is less meaningful than early iterations where it was cutting rewards down from like 50 to 25, for yeah. instance. So the, you you could have enough people trying to justify the fundamentals that they're they're putting a, a higher cap. Maybe it hits 100,000. I would not I would not be surprised to see Bitcoin hit 100,000. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be surprised to see it hit 150, but uh, 100,000 seems totally doable. But yeah. it's uh, it's entirely speculative. We got to move yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Number two in the big three. Uh, Apple has scrapped plans to build a new self-driving EV, um, one in which they had spent ten billion dollars over a course of a decade. Why doesn't Apple make new things anymore? <laughs> Why can't well, they, they? They made the Vision Pro, right? That's a better version of the Meta Quest or the Oculus or. Yeah, but no one. That's not a mainstream thing. You know, people don't really know what yeah. they you know. I mean, arguably, they haven't had a revolutionary new product since the release of the iPhone. And that was over a decade ago, right? It was like 2008-ish. Right. I don't, yeah. I didn't is have the Tim early Is this a Tim Cook issue? Is he just a, um, is he just a custodian of, uh, over, you know, Steve, what Steve Jobs has built, basically? Probably, but I think it's a big tech issue more generally. I mean, like, yeah. Why doesn't Google make innovative? We we were talking about this with the consumer consumer products thing a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. Um, if if you're Google or if you're if you're Apple and you're making billions a year selling iPhones, you want to optimize your iPhones and generate and improve profitability there. You don't want to take a lot of you don't want to make a lot of big bets bets on expensive moonshots. And even like Google's moonshot or Alphabet's moonshot labs or moonshot program doesn't really have a lot to to show for it it's mostly like improved software um, yeah i guess the bigger question is does it does it matter that they're not i mean it's been a while now since they, like you said it's been basically a decade since they came up with something truly revolutionary i mean even like the apple tv plus streamer is one of the weaker streaming services this is a very thin library uh with not a whole lot of you know hits um I, it doesn't matter though, you know, stock prices continue to go up, sales continue to go, you know, I, I'm doing this, I'm saying this while looking at my iPhone, doing this on a MacBook Pro, 
Um, yep, you've got yours. I've got got mine. Um, you know, my kids were using the iPad this morning. Like, is it just so ingrained, um, like with Google, so ingrained in people's lives that they don't need to, you know, create anything truly new anymore, just like tweaks on what was previously existed, what previously existed. I, I guess, you know, maybe we're not giving them credit for like the Apple Watch, right? That's that sort of wearable tech thing was maybe a little bit of innovative, but it's just minimizing the size of your phone screen and putting it on your wrist. Yeah on your wrist um you just cannibalized I, fitbit or not cannibalized but you know uh, it doesn't this will sound cryptic back. but I, I don't think it matters until it matters um right yep. i mean if you look at like what the the cell phone landscape looked like 20 years ago or well, let's say yeah 20 years ago so 2001 2000 through like 2004 2005 um, Motorola was probably arguably the most popular cell phone producer, if not them, Nokia. Nokia certainly has a lot of rose color glasses, uh, you know, people looking back favorably upon their phones being indestructible. And then Apple came out and they released a, a game changer of a product. Um, and now Apple just owns everything. So Motorola thought, Hey, we've got the best phones on the planet or Nokia thought we've got the best phones on the planet. And it didn't matter until somebody came out and, and disrupted them. Um, and I think the same can be said for Apple. They can continue just making bank off of very profitable iPhones until somebody comes along and identifies a gap that most of us just don't see. There, there's, there are disruptors out there that are going to identify a way to do everything the iPhone does, but better or in a way that is more user-friendly. Um, I mean, that's the nature of technology. I, it, will that happen in five years? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Will it happen in 10? Probably. Um, I don't know what that new technology will be. It, it's going to be one of those things that it's like, it'll like we were talking about, how did we not see this coming? It'll be that. It'll be something yeah. that'll be so obvious that it'll be mind-blowing that we missed it, but something will come out. Yeah. Um, well, on the other side of the ledger of uh, how did we not see this coming? We think we did an episode a couple of weeks ago on uh, stocks. How did we, what were we thinking stocks? And one of them, top of the list was uh, Beyond Meat, uh, which is B-Y-N-D. Uh, which was that, which is you know cratered in recent years after a lot of hype. Well, it was up seventy five percent on earnings the other day. It's since pulled back. I think it's. I think you said it's only like twenty nine percent actually now. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? It, you know, usually these. So there was a short. I think there's a short squeeze happening there as part of it. I believe. Yeah, it was very heavily shorted. Yeah. So. Is this the beginning of another, you know, junk stock, meme stock? Not that Beyond Meat is a meme stock, at least not yet. But um, is this? Do you see this as a red flag at all, or early, you know, red flag for the market, for the bull market? No, not not entirely. No, I will say, like Beyond is a little bit of an exception. It's never been a profitable company. Um, they. It's not like they magically turned a profit. They came out and said they were going to cut costs. So they're going to lose less money selling unprofitable stuff that nobody wants. Uh, the, what that what it signals to me more than anything, and we see this, and we'll probably talk about it when we get to micro caps. We see this in some of the small caps where there's like opportunistic rotation into underperforming assets. Um, we're 18, 16, 18 months into the Magnificent Seven, the AI, all that narrative. Um, I just, I think people are looking for opportunities. The obvious trade has been there for a long, long, I say long, long time, for more than a year, and people are looking elsewhere. And that, you know, oftentimes people go back to the same well, they look at what worked the last time the market was at all time highs. So that's part of it. Beyond was working really well in 2021. Um, but I, I do think that it's the market looking to diversify away from the obvious trade, which is probably good. Uh, it's probably good for the broader market in in the uh, the broader sense. Because some of these companies that have been sort of these babies that have been thrown out with the bathwater that have been undeservedly punished by a long term bear market, especially with like small caps, are starting to attract investor attention. And there, there's probably a lot of opportunity out there. So it's not a it's not a red flag to me. Um, I do think it's it's a, it's a continuing signal that we're in a, on a, in a risk on environment and. Uh, it's also a, a maybe a yellow flag in that people are getting tired of the same old trade and they're looking for opportunities elsewhere. So it, it, it's good if it plays out well and it's maybe a, a caution flag if it doesn't. Uh, just put in perspective, Beyond uh, came public 
at um, $25 a share in uh, April 2019 and is now just under 10 a share. So and what did it hit in November of 2021? November of 2021, it was November of 2021. That should have been the, that was the market top. Um, but oh, no, beyond... I have it. I have it as um, 2019, $234. So, $235. Yeah, be, Beyond's peak was 234 almost 235 Uh When the market topped out in November, it was trading at 135 ish. Yeah. Um, so it was very much a beneficiary of the bull market. And right. it's down 7% as we speak today. And yeah, it's returned twenty seven percent in the last five days. So yeah. a little bit of a it was short red squeeze. meat to the sellers. I yeah. <laughs> All right, red and with that, I think I think we're going to take a quick break. We're going to bring on Rich Howe of StockSpinoffInvesting dot com, former Cabot analyst. All right, we welcome on Rich Howe, uh, who runs StockSpinoffInvesting dot com and is a, a former is a Cabot expat. Yeah, used to run. Cabot Microcap Insider, Mike is a microcap expert, expert on spinoff uh, investing. Rich, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Great to be back. Yeah, great to, to see you. See um, so microcaps, I guess, similar to small caps. You know, we had Tyler London on a few weeks ago. It kind of lagged the, um, you know, the market lately or large caps lately, you know, in this magnificent seven driven market that we've mostly seen. But they they've had a pretty good few months. I mean, maybe sort of in line with with the market. Uh, I think I saw um, one microcap ETF was up like thirty percent or so since the start of November. What are you seeing? Are you seeing sort of a, a light at the end of the tunnel with microcaps? Yeah. So um, so it's funny. So it's uh, what we're seeing is um, no end of November. I would say end of November. Uh, starting in November through the year end was like amazing. Right. Like all my stops, all my stocks, small caps, micro caps were just ripping. And I was like, this is so fun. <laughs> like This is fun when your stocks go up and you're making money. And then I would say um, like the, I would say since the year, since the new year began, um, like I was looking at micro, there's not, not too many great micro cap indexes, but like I was looking at one of them and yes, and it was, it's basically flat since the beginning of the year through right now. And if you look at, you know, the S and P 500, obviously it's up, up a good amount S and P 500 equal weighted. It's, it's obviously up, up, a, up a good amount. And so it feels like there's been a little bit of a pause. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I know you guys follow Ryan Dietrich and he always has good yep. charts on Twitter or X or what, whatever it's called. And basically, you know, I'm, I'm sure you saw what it, what he said recently, but basically he said that if you put out, you know, if, if you have a good, you know, typically February is a weak month, but if you, but that hasn't been the case this year, if you have a strong January and a strong February, typically you have a really strong year. Like I think the average is up about 20%. Um, if you have, if you start the year with two good months in a row and then, you know, there's somebody else that I followed that, that talked about kind of the fourth year of a new president's term and typically the year end it tends to tends to continue as it uh, to have a lot of strength into the year end. And so um, it seems to me like um, the market is strong and, you know, it seems like there's pockets of mania here and there, but it seems like the trend is is up and to the right. And as I say, like, don't don't fight the tape. And I can't. I just got to imagine that it's going to be hard for small caps and micro caps to just not have a catch up rally. Like at some point throughout the year, I don't know yep. when it's going to happen, but it feels like um, it's definitely overdue. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I, I think I was telling Chris earlier, maybe a, a prior episode um, that there's been some opportunistic rotation into some of the small caps um, specifically uh, one of the things that I was sort of positing is like it it very much feels like the market is getting bored with the obvious trade with the magnificent seven trade and is starting to expand their their uh, towards the sort of buffet of other offerings uh, where there's increased interest in maybe some unloved or or discarded segments of the market. Uh, are you seeing that? Are you seeing like broadening out of the rally of investor interests? Yeah. 
Yeah, I would say definitely um, in the so like, I, you know, I look at micro cap stocks. I look at stocks like as small as like 50 million market cap. Um, the standard definition for, for a micro cap, I think it's like below 250 million market cap. And I would say below 250 million market cap. Uh, it kind of just depends on the it depends on the story. You know, some some stocks are starting to move if they have really good, really good fundamental stories. I would say the area of the market where there seems to be a movement or like a broadening out like you like you described it is in kind of the small cap space where the market cap is like a billion or, or two billion. And like there's a company, Garrett Motion, which was a, a it's like a former um, spin off that went bankrupt and came out of bankruptcy. And it's been cheap for a long time and nobody's really cared about it, but it seems like the market's finally waking up to that. And it's, it's like a 2 billion market cap. So I feel like that's kind of the sweet spot where, um, you know, if you're, if you're a billion market cap plus um, investors are uh, starting to pay attention a little bit more to that, the, the micro cap space is like, so there's really no institutional investors in there. So it's really just driven by, by individual investors. And so you're kind of at the, at the whim of those individual retail mm -hmm. investors, but I've definitely noticed the trend. I would say the broadening out, especially in the small cap, call it like one to one to three, four billion dollar market cap. And you, Rich, you've always approached micro caps sort of a, a blend of gr not just growth but also value. Um, you're looking for both. Yeah, uh, right. Exactly. I, I guess that sort of makes you know. You mentioned catch up. Uh, you know, a catch up rally at some point, I guess that, that you're probably in sort of a sweet spot now where there's signs of growth, but there's also plenty of value still out there. 100%. Yeah, 100%. So what I always like to say is I always so like in the micro cap space, what's fun is finding companies that are like growing really, really quickly, but are trading, trading at value at value prices. Um, and then that's also you can also find that in the spinoff space, too, because what's interesting about spinoffs is that um, oftentimes like a large company will spin off a smaller subsidiary and that small subsidiary, even if it's growing, you know, really quickly, will um, by mandate um, the, the, the portfolio manager that owns the large cap stock won't be able to own the smaller cap stock just because the portfolio will be focused on on large cap stocks. And so, um, so oftentimes you'll see selling pressure on some stocks that actually have pretty fundamental, nice growth outlooks, um, but are trading at, at value prices. So that's kind of that's kind of the sweet spot. And then, as you mentioned, yeah, like if the market continues to move up and if large cap stocks continue to to appreciate, which it seems like, you know, we're not going to fight the trend. It seems like that that's what they're going to continue to do. Um, at some point, small cap stocks and micro cap stocks look cheap. At some point, there's going to be a catch up trade. You know, who knows when it's going to happen? But it, it just it seems like the elastic band is getting stretched further and further. And at some point, it's going to snap back. So you were talking about the the inability of fund managers to hold the spinoffs because it misaligns with whatever the fund uh, mission statement is. Um, it, do you have a rule of thumb? Is there a rule of thumb where it's like, hey, if this stock, you know, I'm thinking, say, 3M, right? They're spinning yep. off their healthcare segment. Uh, 3M is going to spin off their healthcare segment. They're going to be selling that for, let's say, two weeks or a month or whatever. But then yep. it's safe to buy or it's optimal to buy at an X date after the spinoff transaction. Is there a rule of thumb at all? I... Definitely. Yeah, it's a great question. So basically, um, t typically, if you have like a, a large cap company, uh, the situation the situation with 3M might be a little different in that um, uh, 3M is a large cap company. And then the healthcare business is going to be a large cap company, too. So yeah. theoretically, the portfolio manager that owns 3M can continue to own um, the healthcare division, I think it's going to be called Sol Solvent Ventum. Um, yeah. but, um, but so, so that's like a little bit of a, a situation where who knows if we'll see the selling pressure, but typically mm -hmm. what I look for is, um, I look for like 50%, uh, at least 50% of shares outstanding to have traded before you're, you're going to see a bottom. So like, say a company has the spinoff has a hundred million shares outstanding. What I'll do is I'll wait till 50% of like 50 million shares have traded um, before uh, establishing a position in, in the spinoff. And the way that you can find out how many shares have traded is just like Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance has yep. that information for free. Um, but but generally the rule of thumb, it, wait at least a couple weeks and then till at least 40 or 50% of shares outstanding have traded.
that might be the most actionable piece of information that has ever been relayed on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> like, very Probably clear cut, very specific guideline. I love that. Um, yeah, I very much take your point uh, about Solventum potentially remaining a large cap, but um, thank you. It's very insightful. Yeah, of course. And are there, are there segments of the market now uh that you're where you're seeing more spin-offs happening or more i guess attractive spin-offs happening yeah so i would say um right now i'm looking at my upcoming spin-off calendar right now so we so cummins right now is spinning off it's basically filtration business um so that's that that's going to be happening by the middle of March. Then we have uh, GE spinning off its power generation business uh, coming up. 3M spinning off its healthcare business. So I would say that there's not really too much of a theme in terms of um, you know what specific sector it seems okay. like the spinoffs spinoffs are are focusing on. But what I tend to, to tend to look for is occasionally um, occasionally you can have like a micro cap spinoff. That can be like a crazy good opportunity where it's trading below net cash. It's trading at a ridiculously good price. An example of that was was um, BBX Capital. So at one point that stock was trading like at at a fifty percent discount to the cash on its balance sheet. So it, it seemed like a crazy good deal, and it turned out to be a really good deal. And the stock performed really well. But but a lot of times the microcap spinoffs are just kind of crappy businesses that don't perform well. You have the indiscriminate selling pressure and then they don't bounce back. And so that's a lesson that I've kind of learned over time. The situations that tend to be the best situations, I think, are the situations where there's a, a spinoff and it's a smaller cap company, but it's a real business. Like it is a billion market cap or it is a two billion market cap. So there's going to be like some institutional investors that can actually buy it. Because if you're under a billion or if you're under 500 million, you're really just just relying on individual retail investors, which which is it's kind of tough. It's nice to have the institutional support to come into uh, to, to want to buy the stocks. So my ideal situation is when like you have a large cap company that has maybe a 30 billion or or, or more market cap spinning off like a 1 billion to 2 billion market cap company, because then you see the indiscriminate selling pressure because maybe the parent company is in the S and P 500 and the remain, the spinoff is not going to be in the S and P 500 examples of that would be Prudential PLC spun off Jackson financial. That was, that was a good setup. Um, let's see VF Corp spun off contour brands. That was, that was a good setup. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the, the ideal situations that I look for. Yeah, that's, it's especially relevant given the popularity of passive investing and how much money has just flown there over the last decade. Uh, and that is sort of exactly what I was what I was thinking when I was asking you about that Solventum one. Uh, sorry, Chris, I stepped on you. No, is, uh, is have you seen a pickup in spinoffs since the market, you know, has improved lately or is it similar? Or what are you seeing? Yeah, so definitely. So um, I think on average in the U.S., there's probably about 20, you know, 20 spinoffs, maybe 15 to 20 spinoffs, depending on the year. When the market's incredibly volatile, like during COVID, like people basically, there's no spinoffs, there's no new spinoffs happening mm -hmm. and no new spinoffs announced because everybody's just trying to like get their, get their, get their stuff together. Mm -hmm. Um but like right now, the markets, you know, we've had had a good run last year, had another, you know, um, the market seems to be off to a good start this year. And so we there has been actually a decent amount of new spin off announcements. And then coming up in the next, let's see, in the next couple. So we have Cummins spinning off its eight, its um its filtration business. We have GE spinning off its its power business. We have 3M spinning off its um its healthcare business. So yeah, decent amount of of activity, you know, over the next month or so, and then we got a bunch bunch more activity um over the next uh you know rest of the year. Brad, Brad, you can go ahead. Yeah, um, so I I do want to get back to to microcaps. I mean, we've been talking about spinoffs uh spinoffs a lot. Are there are there any are you seeing any yellow flags right? Because I, part one of one of the things that we do on our our podcast, we talk about like defending takes, right? Whatever, mm -hmm. some some flashy opinion that's going to get pushed back or that's going to look bad after the fact. Yeah, um, and one one that I wanted to throw out was <laughs> that you know the Russell two thousand is going to be the next, so small cap specifically, but mm -hmm. that's going to be the next index to get it to generate double digit returns, right? Because uh, the market's sort of diversifying out. But the the thing I kept coming back to was 
that's going to take some very specific macroeconomic conditions, right? We're going to need a strong economy. We're going to need signs that um, the Fed is ready to move forward with cutting rates. Like it, it had too many qualifiers for us to use for that segment. But it does make me wonder if there are any yellow flags that you're seeing out there for small caps, for micro caps. Um, is there anything that's raising the the hack that's raising the hackles, raising the hair on the back of your neck at all? I mean, I think the only thing um, that is is can be really concerning is just like debt load. So like interest rates, as we all know, even though they've started to moderate a little bit, still are are up a lot over the past couple of years. And so that used to not be an issue for some of these small cap and micro cap companies. And it's becoming, you know, it's becoming a real issue and and really something um, something to keep it keep an eye on. I mean, I'm you know mostly looking for like individual situations um kind of from a bottom-up perspective where i think the fundamentals look really really good um but obviously or you know if 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 we do enter a recession um like small caps are gonna are gonna take it on the yeah. chin and micro caps are gonna take it on the chin um so um I, i'd say the the big thing that kind of jumps out is just i mean it's really obvious but just the interest rates the higher interest rates um because yeah. a lot of these small cap companies do have you know a decent amount of debt yeah so then your your ideal micro cap then is sort of all right we're we're sort of past or we're acknowledging that the risk is, macro risks exist is going to be something that's got uh, maybe a lot of cash on the balance sheet or it has a, a meaningful enough amount of cash on the balance sheet to continue operations while interest rates are high and ideally has a low debt load. Would that be accurate? Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, 100 percent. Like IDT um, is a uh, it's the market cap's like 800 million dollars. So maybe not a micro cap, but probably a micro cap for 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 most people. Um, and it's a name that I recommended when I was, um, you know, at Cabot doing the Cabot Micro Cap Insider. And it's a name that I still like a lot, but that's kind of an ideal setup for me because it's a it's a stock that has they have like 200 million dollars of cash in their balance sheet. So there's there's no risk if we go into a big recession or something like that. They're not dependent on capital markets. And then it's trading like on a consolidated basis. It's trading at a pre pretty cheap um uh, cheap valuation. I think it's trading like eight or nine times EBITDA. But then if you do a sum of the parts analysis, and this company is, it, it's it's basically in their DNA to spin off the underlying pieces of, of the business. What they do is they incubate new businesses. And then eventually, once they get to, to size, they spin them out. And so you know that you're going to get the sum of the parts, that value is going to get distributed to you. And so that's kind of an ideal situation where there's there's no risk. You know, it's going to be volatile. It's a micro cap. But it has plenty of cash on its balance sheet. It's not dependent on on you know financial financial markets or or debt capital markets. And then the underlying businesses are doing well. And then you're going to have some sort of valuation unlock from a from a spinoff uh, situation. I would say that's kind of you know the ideal setup. I think you said. I think I remember one of the a characteristic that you really look for in microcaps is insider buying, right? To make sure you're aligned with you know company executives. Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's that's incredibly important. So, you know, ideally, I want um, insiders to own ten to twenty percent of the company. There's there's kind of a sweet spot because if you own fifty percent plus of a company, you get into a situation where you you start to wonder like, are insiders going to try to squeeze me out and steal the company from me? But if you're you know in the ten to twenty percent plus, but below fifty percent range. Then you know that the the management team and, and the owners of the business are operating like they would if they owned it because they 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 do own it and you're you're really aligned. It doesn't mean that it's it's all going to necessarily go well, but I think that's something that's incredibly important in the in the micro cap space, which you just can't really have in the large cap space, right? Because it's right. when you're a, a massive company, you you can't uh, as a as a as a CEO, you can't own that many shares. Right, yeah. and the other thing that in the that you have it gives you an advantage in the micro cap world is that because there's so little, you know, analysts, uh, so, so few analysts that cover these stocks, you get direct access. You talk, you're talking to CEOs of some of these companies, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that that's the nice thing too, where you can um, get on the phone, uh, meet with them, attend the annual meetings, have you know one-on-one -on -one conversations with the CEOs, CFOs, meet you know heads of the underlying divisions. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely yeah. I'd say the big the big benefits of why I love microcap so much are um, it's management access. It's really easy to to talk to the company, 
it's um you can get growth at a value price right like you can you can get a really fast growing company at a at a at a quote unquote value price they're generally easier to understand like there's not as many moving moving pieces and so um yeah there there's a lot to like about about microcaps tell us about uh stock spinoff investing.com yeah so um so yeah so so my website i basically cover the stock spinoff uh universe so basically um as you mentioned, in any given year, there's probably like 15 or 20 different different spinoffs that take place. My primary focus is on the U.S., but I do uh, cover some international spinoffs when when they look interesting. Um, but but basically, my focus is on covering the spinoff market. Um, every spinoff that's coming to market, I try to do a deep dive on so that I'm looking at the the the, the parent company and the company that's going to be spun off before it begins to it begins to trade. Because, um, like we talked about, if there's an attractive uh, business and you know that there's going to be indiscriminate selling pressure, it can be a really good opportunity to buy 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 a stock, buy something from somebody who's kind of a forced non-economic seller, and especially if you think that the business is a good underlying business. And so I try to do deep dives on all spinoffs that are coming to market. And then I just recommend my highest conviction ideas uh, to the subscribers. Then I I invest in the ideas as well. So that's that's kind of the basic the basic focus of uh, of stock spinoff investing. And so you have a portfolio that tracks you know X amount of spinoffs. Um, you know from you know beginning to whatever happens after that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. Yep. What What's your normal holding period? How How far out yeah. do you go with these? So it kind of depends. So sometimes there will be like special situations that are like quick, quick turnover. So I'll give you an example. Um, so right now, um, so uh, let's see, Cummins is, is spinning off Atmos Filtration, which is its its filtration business. And they're, they're doing the spinoff uh, via an exchange offer, meaning that if you're a Cummins shareholder, you can exchange your shares for shares of, of Atmos Filtration. Um, but anybody who owns Cummins doesn't necessarily want to own shares of a spinoff. Why would you want to own shares of, a, of, of, a, of this filtration business? You bought Cummins for a reason. To incentivize yep. shareholders to exchange their shares of Cummins for shares of Atmos Filtration, they're giving you basically 7.5% more value in shares of the spinoff than you own in Cummins. So said simply, if you own $100 worth of Cummins, you're going to get $108 worth of Atmos Filtration stock. And so there's, it's basically like a free seven or eight percent that you can earn in in about a month. So the one caveat is that there's going to be, uh, there's this is going to be um, oversubscribed. It's a free launch. People are there's going to be a lot of common shareholders that want to do this. The cool thing about these split off transactions is that there's an odd lot provision such that if you own fewer than a hundred shares, you won't get prorated. And so, you know, today you could buy 99 shares of Cummins, elect to exchange those shares into Atmos filtration shares and make the math works out to right now about $2,000, $2, about 7.5% over, you know, about a month holding period. And so like, that's, that's, a, that's a type of situation that, which will be more of a, a, a quick trade. Mm -hmm. um which will be like about a month or maybe even shorter um but i'd say on but then i i'm i'm also recommending stocks like idt which i've recommended for like three years um and that one's you know up a lot but i still think it's worth worth a lot more and so it kind of varies i would say the i think last time i checked my average holding period is about 12 months um but it kind of varies depending on whether it's like a short special situation or like a long yeah. long-term hold and again, that's stockspinoffinvesting.com. Uh, Rich, really, really good stuff. Uh, good to have you back on. Um, you know, we don't we don't talk about microcaps a whole lot on this podcast. We've been, you know, so bogged down with Magnificent Seven and NVIDIA, uh, the Fed for obvious reasons. So uh, it's part of why I wanted to have you on just to get sort of uh, get out of our usual, you know, sort of comfort zone and, and uh, talk about stocks that people might not even be aware of, um, you know, and microcaps spinoffs. Uh, thanks for providing so much insight on those. And um, we appreciate you joining us. Yeah, Chris, really good to see you guys. Thanks for having me on. Brad, great to see you. Um, yeah, this, this is fun, man. Anytime you guys need to switch up, switch up, uh, switch it up from like Magnificent Seven or, or whatever the yeah. latest hot theme of the market is i'm i'm happy to to chat with you guys this is fun yeah, yeah good we'll to have, see you. yeah we'll have you on again and uh thanks for joining street check uh, we'll be back next week